Okay, so now that we've covered some basic concepts in deontological theory, we're going to talk about Judith Jarvis Thompson's killing, letting die, and the trolley problem. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have already heard of the trolley problem, or maybe you've even seen it um, depicted in various memes online. It's, it's sort of taken off um, very popularly in the public imagination. Uh, it's one of the most famous or well-known thought experiments. And it was originally devised by a philosopher named Philippa Foote, but it was made very famous by Judith Jarvis Thompson. So it involves a scenario in which you are able to stand at a switch which changes the course of a trolley, a sort of runaway trolley. And this trolley is headed um, towards five people who are maybe tied to the track, and they will certainly die if they're hit. So you have the option... Um, if you wish to pull the switch and divert the trolley, which will send the trolley down a different track, and in this case will only kill one person. So if you don't pull the switch, um, if you do nothing, it will continue, and you will in some sense have let five people die, because you have the choice, um, but five people will die, and if you pull the switch, you will be an active participant in the killing of one person. So the trolley problem is intended to offer a scenario in which many people think it would be permissible to kill one person by actively pulling the switch in order to save five others. And this is sort of in contrast because in, in general, as a rule, people tend to find it impermissible to kill one person in order to save five others. So you might take, for example, the case which she describes in which five people are in need of an organ transplant. And... Uh, there's a doctor who has the ability to kill um, one person who's an organ match for all these five other people and give their healthy organs to those in need of transplant, which would allow the five to live. So this is also a case in which um, we are killing one to save five, but people tend to find this situation um, is not morally permissible. That in the case of the organ transplant, it is not permissible to kill the one harvest their organs, and give it to five sick people in order to save them. Now, um, it seems obvious, right, that if we're given the option between having five people live and having one person live, it seems better that more people should live. Um, the utilitarian is certainly going to say, of course, it's obvious that you should always do what you can to have the five people live rather than the one. But the trolley problem is one in which you aren't just choosing between these two options um, because in order to make this happen, you must actively choose to pull the switch and to, in a sense, kill this person. So this calls back to the title of the essay, Killing and Letting Die, because it happens to emphasize um, the sort of stakes of the problem here, which is, is it worse to kill someone or to let someone die? and why, which is, of course, what Judith Jarvis Thompson is concerned with. So, as a rule, let's say killing one to save five is not permissible, but the trolley problem and a small subset of cases seem to offer an exception. So, why do these exceptions seem to exist, and why is it wrong as a general rule um, are important questions here. So, a few things to note about this piece in general and about Thompson's writing style is that it involves the use of a lot of cases. And some people can find this very difficult to parse through because it can be very complex. The cases that she offers are very detail rich. So I would suggest just taking your time while reading and um, you might go over cases a few times if you find this helpful or go over her discussion of cases a few times. Because um, I think the reason she does this is because she really wants to emphasize the different features of each case and offer us a very nuanced nuanced reasons why we find certain cases to be permissible and others not to be. So overall, I think you might describe her writing as very rich here. It's sort of dense with um, many details and many philosophical reasons. Um, so take your time while reading it. Another thing to note is that Thompson is a rights-based theorist. So she is concerned with personal rights and with personal claims and not just with something like maximizing utility. So when she starts to piece apart why in some instances killing might be permissible 
and why in other instances um, letting die or not choosing to divert a certain good or a certain harm towards a person is the right thing to do, she boils it down to a claim of, to an issue of who has a claim to certain goods or who has a claim against certain harms. And there are different things that might offer someone a claim to a certain good or a claim against a certain harm. So for example, in the transplant case, the healthy person who in the thought experiment is a potential candidate for having their organs harvested to save five others has much more of a claim to their own organs than any of the other five, the five sick people, simply because it is their own body. They grew those organs, and in some sense, they have something like ownership or possession over them. So this seems like a really, a pretty uncontroversial example, and one in which um, the one has more of a claim to the life-saving goods, in this case, the organs that they grew themselves, in question than any of the five. And so in this case, it seems that killing the one in order to save the five is not permissible. And part of the reason that it's not permissible is because the one has a, a, a more reasonable claim um, or more a claim that we are willing to respect more to the goods in question. So when we talk about rights against a certain harm, for example, against the harm of being hit by a speeding trolley, she says the reasons can get more complicated or it can be less clear cut why one has a claim against a certain harm. But she offers a few different iterations of the trolley problem to help us articulate why um, or to help us to articulate what these differences or what these reasons might be. So let's go through a few of these examples. Okay, so first she offers a spin on the trolley case in which there are five railroad workers the, the five on the tracks are railroad workers who know the risks of the job. They're, they know it's a high-risk job, and they're paid extra money. They're compensated very highly for the risks of this job. And the one on the other side of the track, who you might divert towards, is just someone who has been invited to a special picnic near the railroad tracks by the mayor. And the mayor has, like, set out the space for the picnic. He has ensured that everyone at the picnic is going to be safe. He's like explicitly said this. Um, and in this case, and, and this person, this one who finds themselves on the track unwittingly, um, would not even be in that part of town, would not even be near the railroad tracks had the mayor not invited him to this picnic and told him that this would be safe. And so she says, in this case, she says the one has more of a claim to safety than the five because they've essentially been promised safety, they've been guaranteed safety, where the five know that they know some of the risks of this job. They know that sometimes there are runaway trolleys and sometimes these things do happen. So she says, in this case, it is not permissible to pull the switch and divert the train um, to kill the one instead of letting it on its course kill the five. Now she compares this to cases in which the situation, she says, is sort of on par in relevant respects. For example, if both the one and the five, they're all railway workers, they're all track workers, and they've just been assigned to different parts of the track at random, or if there's an evil villain who has kidnapped six people and tied one to one part of the track and five to another, she says, in this case, it is morally permissible to turn the train to kill the one and save the five, but it's not morally required. But it is permissible in these cases because they all have um, more or less an equal claim uh, against the harm of the train. So finally, she offers a case in which there are five track workers who are repairing the track and there's a schoolboy who is looking for pebbles and special rocks on the track and he climbs a fence to get onto the track and he sees all these warning signs. He can read them very clearly that say danger, do not, no civilians on the track. And he doesn't care. He climbs over the fence. He says, no one's going to divert. No one wants to hit a schoolboy. So I'm going to be fine. And he climbs over the fence and gets onto the track. So she argues that in this case, the trolley must be turned in order to save the five um, because the boy has much less of a claim given how he has ignored all warning signs, so he has much less of a claim against the risk of the trolley 
than the track workers do. Okay, so that's a lot of different cases, I think, that I've just covered fairly quickly. And it's not even close to the number of cases that she goes over in the paper. But I think we can use these to get what are some of the main takeaways from this piece. One, I think, is that when we are involved in moral deliberation, we are concerned with more than just the outcome. And rights-based claims are crucial to our moral thinking. Claims about who has a, a right to what good, or who has a claim against a particular harm. Another is that the source of these claims can be very nuanced and complex. So essentially, the details of the cases matter a great deal. I think this is why, she, again, she uses so many cases to sort of illuminate um, the nuances as they come up. So we cannot take a rule like killing is worse than letting die and apply it in every scenario. Just like we can't take a rule like killing one in order to save five is always right because we have to look at the nuances that give us um, the rights-based claims in question that we need to use to make these moral deliberations. So she sort of ends the piece by saying that the thesis that killing is worse than letting die cannot be used in any simple mechanical way in order to yield conclusions about abortion, euthanasia, and the distribution of sparse, scarce medical resources. These cases have to be looked at individually. And these, some of these topics are uh, things that she addresses later. She has a very famous paper um, that comes out uh, in favor of abortion rights um, based on some of these similar rights claims. Um, so that's a very interesting paper. Uh, it's a very famous paper. If any of you are interested in reading that, just reach out, um, and I'm happy to point you in that direction. Um, but that is... Uh, killing, letting die, and the trolley problem.